the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, it's Just the Tip Sisters with Melissa Morgan. Howdy. If you've got a tip for Melissa, a weird story you'd like to have investigated, a murder in your hometown, how to avoid a coma while watching a televised poker tournament, anything, tell us about it by calling the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837 or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. You just might hear your tip on the podcast. And now here's your host. I could tell you what she's wearing to the Halloween costume contest, but she'd have to kill you. Melissa Morgan! More cowbell? Well, I use the word howdy because uh, this week's case comes all the way from deep in the heart of Texas. And um, in your intro... (laughs) In your intro, it sounded like you said how to avoid a como. Oh, co- well. While no, watching a televised. A coma, a coma while, so it kind of kind of went together. How to avoid a, a coma. coma while. Got a it. Co- okay. A coma while, while watching. watching. It yeah. sounded like como. And I was like, to avoid, do you avoid peri como while watching uh, uh, poker? It's I always didn't good to avoid watching peri como when play you're poker. trying to play poker. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because yeah, then you nod off and <laughs> shit gets even more ugly. Yeah, yeah, especially since he's dead. So, oh, there's that. So trying to watch him, not really a not good helpful. idea. And he probably wore a lot of sunglasses, which a lot of poker players do. Uh, so to hide there, so there's no tells. Ooh, you know the terminology. I know nothing. That's just a, a thing. I think everyone knows. You're a you're a poker shark, aren't I'm you? I'm a shark, total shark. Yeah. Right. I believe you know that to be so not true. Well, as you tried to teach me, uh, what's the one where you go to twenty one blackjack in a uh, hotel room in uh, Las Vegas before taking me to Fremont Street or whatever it's called. We went Binions. to downtown. Yeah, yeah. I went to the old school. Yeah, Mark is teaching, trying to teach me blackjack in the hotel room and i'm like but it says j <laughs> yeah and there was a very nice a lady very nice dealer at the table we went to that kind yes. of kind of winked at melissa and told her when to you know uh well she didn't actually wink at me but when i went to um hit 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 me is that yeah. what you call mm-hmm. it um and i had a jack and a nine she kind of just slightly shook her head no because i thought it was a like a one and a nine or, or no i had an ace and a nine i don't know what i well, had I think you had an ace and a nine which is 20 ace and a nine which i and i thought that was 10 because i thought an ace was one well it could be it could be 10 but you don't want to hit on it that's right, for sure right if you know what you're doing and i do not and you i still believe want, you still want enough to buy us dinner that we night. we i won 85 dollars and we got it in fives and took it home and took it back to the hotel and laid it out on the bed and rolled around in it like indecent proposal. That's only because you wanted to. Because I wanted to. You didn't want to, but I did. But we did. $85 in fives spread out on a bed in a hotel room in Vegas, rolling around on it with um, a five stuck in my butt crack. It was a night I, think, I will not. I, th- I think we didn't we didn't need to tell them about that part. It was a night I won't forget. I feel like it's important to share. Mm-hmm. That, but that's that's my poker history. So... Sometimes you get a case that you're familiar with, but you forget the details. And, you know, God and the devil are apparently in the details. And this is a detail of a fucking case. And it, I remember seeing it, it has been covered on 48 hours and on Dateline. And I remember seeing it and thinking, you know, shaking my head, thinking to myself, you know, wow. Wow. But when someone that you respect, a tipster, uh, Vanessa, not her real name, but we're calling her that, sends you the information and you delve a little deeper and you're, and then you're like, wow, wow. Not just wow, but wow, wow. You, you know, you have to cover it. And especially when, even though there has been, um, what one could say, you know, legal ramifications, it, it's still, it's still an open case. And it's, I believe an investigator called it, um, he, he wouldn't call it an open case, but he called it unresolved. 
So that's, I think that's a really great description. And there's many places that this information came from that is amazing information. Some of the most uh, beautifully written comes from a blog, uh, thetroublewithjustice.com. And the writer is a fantastic uh, blog writer who who is uh, poetic, and, and so is Vanessa and her description. The reason it's it's an even more important case and that Vanessa alerted us to it, reminded us of it again, is that Vanessa has an inside uh, look at uh, some of the things that went on in this case, some of the personalities and backgrounds, uh, because she was a up-close observer to some of it. And her description and her experiences are just as interesting what she saw and felt um, as the case. So in the wonderful blog, The Trouble with Justice, it is noted that uh, the people of Norway have been using the word Texas, mostly written with like a, in lowercase t, uh, and sometimes with an exclamation point when they want to describe something that's crazy or out of control. It's uh, dat verhalt Texas, which means that is totally Texas. And really, yes. And that is, I think, the best way to describe this cape case. It is totally Texas. Uh, God bless Norway for that description, because I have mentioned it before and I'm just, you know, extraordinarily bitter and I'll just mention it again and again. But I spent six weeks uh, in Austin, Texas in 2002 working on an independent film. And it was, quite frankly, six of the worst weeks of my life. Now, granted, not all of it was because it took place in Texas, but mm, large part of it. Yeah, yeah. Apparently it was a unseasonable uh, heat spell. It was the end of April through the beginning of June, and it was hot and humid and awful. I uh, was staying in a condo with a couple of other crew members, and the door to my bedroom, uh, it was built so badly that the wall, the floor was slanted, and I'm sleeping on a blow-up mattress, by the way, so you can tell it was an independent film. <laughs> um, and uh, the floor was so slanted that when I went to bed at night, if I wanted the door to shut, because it would never stay shut, no matter how you tried, lock, anything, I had to put my shoes against it to hold the door shut. Now, that's not Texas's fault. I was going to say. Yeah, I just let me finish, okay, smarty pants. I know you have a real soft spot in your heart for Texas. I don't cur. You start your own podcast, call it I Love Texas by Mark Humphreys. I don't cur. I pray every day that Texas secedes from the Union and goes back to me- back to Mexico. I pray for that on a daily basis. There's a lot of people there that would love to do that. Yeah, I wish they would. Yes, that's exactly what Vanessa said, too. So, you know, when we cross the border uh, into Texas with our wonderful uh, moving truck filled with, you know, uh, cameras and um, set pieces and bullshit, there's a sign that says, welcome to the United States of Texas. And I thought, oh, that's funny and quaint. And no, no, that is how they feel. It is... It's the United States of Texas. That's just that's just it in the hand cart. Um, it was just a really, I stepped on a, it was a really bad experience. I stepped on a mound of fire ants. I have a, I still have a scar on my ankle from being bitten by fire ants. It was just, it was, and that again, that actually is Texas's fault. But anyway, so um, my love of Texas, not at all, is, is sort of wrapped up not just in the phrase, you know, from Norway, that's so Texas, but from things like this, and this, this isn't, while it is unique, while it is unique in its breadth and scope, I don't know that it's unique for Texas because there's, you know, um, as it was explained by tipster Vanessa, old oil money is like royalty. And I feel like that's probably true. Um, You know, I'm not saying everyone in Texas is a hypocrite. There's wonderful, amazing things and people in Texas. But you see a lot of, you hear a lot about people with an enormous amount of wealth who pat themselves on the back hard for 
you know, donating money to charity. There's a lot of good works that come from the oil money in Texas. A lot of good works. I understand and believe that for sure. But on the other hand, there's a lot of shady bullshit that is able to be enacted because you have the money and it is overwhelming and uncomfortable and awful. But here we go. This is the case of Cullen Davis. And it's, it's a big one. So Cullen is a Texas boy born and raised who was born in 1933. And he's the middle son of three sons of this very um, well off oil man, Ken Davis, who I can't even believe I'm saying this out loud as a grown ass adult. His, his nickname his entire life until he died was Stinky. I don't, I know. What? That's some classy, that's some classy Texas shit right there. Stinky Davis. So they didn't come from money, apparently. Well, he, he became really wealthy by acquiring oil field supply companies at bargain prices. And then he assembled them under an umbrella corporation called Ken Davis Industries International, KII. I would just call it Stinky Co., but that's just me. <laughs> so after, you know, he assembles Stinky Co. by buying, um, you know, buying out people on the cheap and then raising the prices, um, he, uh, the, the sons take over um, his business. He dies in 1968. So the three sons take over. Now, they turn Stinky Co. from this little family endeavor of $300 million to over $1.03 billion in 10 years. So from 68 to 78, they have turned it into, you know, something pretty big. And while Stinky Davis was, you know, the kind of guy who was frugal and liked to live on, live on the cheap, even though he had, you know, m hundreds of millions of dollars, his, his middle son, at least, <laughs> Cullen, was... I am going to live in the lap of luxury forever. And that's just going to happen. He also had an eye for the ladies. He had a private jet. He liked furs. Don't know a lot of dudes who dig the furs, but okay. Or the jewelry, but a lot of, you know, a lot of pinky rings and shit. So Cullen's brother, Bill, is not happy with all of the overspending and is really upset that he has... $16 million in debt that he has collected personal debt because he has used the company as collateral to get loans. Not smart. Right. So brother Bill sues Cullen and, you know, says this is, you cannot use our father's company, Ken Davis International Stinky Co. Industries as collateral for your personal loans. So Cullen and his older brother, Ken, end up buying Bill's interest out of the business. And then they went their separate ways, F you know, for decades. They didn't speak after this very kind of vicious tug of war over the business. So Cullen has married in 1962 his girlfriend, Sandra, and they got kind of tired of each other after not very long, actually. And he had such an appetite for other women. He really wasn't hiding anything about where he was going and what he was doing. And Sandra was like, look, he, he beats me in private and he slaps me in public. And that is pretty well noted. And he just wants out of the marriage. So he really doesn't hide it when he meets this beautiful, sexy woman named Patricia, I'm sorry, Priscilla Wilborn, who's married to Jack Wilborn. And I believe they met at, at a tennis club and they, she's a tiny little petite, like five foot two, little petite blonde. She's been married twice. She's got three kids and she's kind of the, you know, enticement for him because she's from the wrong side of the track, so to speak. But she's, you know, well off. She's married. Jack Wilborn has um, a very successful career. He's a car dealer and, you know, she has a great life and she meets, you know, Cullen at the, at the tennis club, at the country club, and they just can't keep their hands off each other. Now, 
there are some that say Cullen is truly Priscilla's the love of her life. I think she, I think she may have, she may have disagreed with that, but there was something in her that kept, that kept her wanting to stay with him, even though he was not great to her, although she did find her backbone and and stand up. So for herself and her and her family. So they say she, you know, fell hard for his money and it would be, it would be tough. You know, you already are well off. You're not that happy in your marriage. And there's a guy who has a private jet and, you know, even more money. Right. So Priscilla wasn't, you know, born with a silver spoon in her mouth. She was happy when she first married Jack and they had the kids. She had her first baby um, with her first husband, but they were separated like six months after they got married and it, you know, she, she said her father, uh, worked, he was a geologist in the oil industry. And she said, you know, I didn't really know him because he forgot to come home and he never sent a check. So her mom was pretty much the main influence in her life and her her mom, Audie and never, you know, they just didn't have any money, you know, to, to spend ever. And she grew up in suburban Houston. She graduated from high school, early at age 16. So she's smart, but she married Jasper Baker and they gave birth to her first daughter D and then, you know, like six months, I guess D is six months old when she decides to move on because she says Jasper's cheating. So she, not that long after, you know, she's 19 with a, with a baby and she marries Jack Wilborn and moves to Fort Worth and they have a son named Jack and a daughter named Andrea. And so she has D Jack and Andrea D with the first husband, Jack and Andrea with, um, with Jack and little Jack. (laughs) So even after, you know, he has lost his wife to Cullen Davis, um, Jack says about his ex-wife Priscilla, you know, she's generous to a fault. She's really open and completely unpretentious. And if you call her your friend, you can't have a better friend. So this is after she left him mm-hmm, for Colin Davis for, wow. you know, the guy with more money. So that's the kind of, I feel like that says a lot because that shows you what kind of person she was. She did not engender a bunch of people who hated her in her life. She, I think was a really vivacious, outgoing, special woman. And, you know, you may have loved her. You may have not, but if you loved her, you, I think you loved her a lot. So they, uh, Cullen and Priscilla end up being a couple after they're divorced. Um, obviously, <laughs> it's thought that they were together before both of their divorces were final, but both of them denied it. <laughs> At least Priscilla did. I don't know if Cullen did, but I know Priscilla was like, no, nothing happened until after we were divorced. So they end up getting married in 1968 it just so happens to be the same day that Stinky dies. Oh. Right. Stinky with whom they broke up. No, Stinky was the was Cullen's father with all the money. Oh, Stinky was the original founder. That's yeah, right. Stinky, oh, my God. Stinky Davis Co. Stinky Co. Stinky Co. Mm-hmm. So they, you know, they get married the same day that his father dies and leaves him all the money. Now, that makes it seem to people who are on the outside looking in that she's a gold digger, but they'd been together and it just, you know, it it was bad timing. It was bad timing, but you know, who's to say, I mean, I, I never, it's, it's a tough thing when someone has more money than God, it just, but there were, you know, they were very much in love, at least at first for the first like six years, they were very much in love before she decided to to divorce him because things were not so great after a while. But Priscilla fit in perfectly in his weird world of excess. And she loved wearing furs and jewelry. And she was kind of known for this favorite necklace that she wore that in diamonds, it spelled out rich bitch. Okay. Right. So she has a sense of humor about the fact that people are calling, you know, calling her a, a gold digger. And she probably is like, yeah, so what? I like, I dig gold. Fuck off. Gold is awesome. I like white gold myself. But so, you know, she was, 
I think his partner definitely and his match as far as let's just call it what it is tackiness. So she, she, you know, that phrase where some people have more money than taste. So she decorates, they have a skybox at, you know, at a stadium that she decorates in pink and she shows up at the country club in hot pants and, you know, the things that you're not supposed to do when you're this, you know, rich Southern lady, whatever. So there's lots of rumors that this, you know, big giant goofy mansion that Cullen wanted built that, you know, took three years to build. And he, he wanted something that showed, you know, off his wealth, who he really was. There just was never a house big enough for him. So it, it took three years to build. And it was at first said to have cost, you know, in, in the early to mid seventies, $3.8 million. But now it's, it probably cost cost closer to six is what the real truth is. So in, in those dollar amounts and that in those years, you can imagine. And, oh, it's t- in today's dollars. Right. Oh my God. Yeah. And it's, um, and there's a lot of money in Texas, but this was known as the mansion. That's how big it was. There's a lot of mansions in Texas. This was known as the mansion. Now it could be, it's, it was sort of like oddly placed on 176 acres and it is really unattractive. And I'm sure for the 70s, it was, you know, this architectural, you know, dream. And it just is, I remember seeing, and I do not remember if it was Dateline or 48 Hours, but an a, a overhead shot, you know, from a from an aircraft of this house. And I thought, what the fuck is, why did you do so it looks like there's some skylights, like a large amount of skylights, but there's these odd additions that have a, like a very large sloping roof. And then there's a part with like a flat roof that's probably where he could land, you know, a helicopter or something. It's, it's, you know, very gaudy and audacious and not, not attractive. It's, it, it's unattractive in my, in my mind. And apparently it was, you know, decorated with, um, I always say something like, um, like Barbara Cartland threw up all over it. And she was an author of like really bad, you know, bodice ripping romance novels, <laughs> a lot of guilt, uh, G I L T not being guilty of something, a lot of guilted gold, crazy bullshit. So this is, you know, built in, in Fort Worth and there's all this marble and, all of these trinkets from their travels and these like giant paintings of Cullen and Priscilla, you know, in the staircase that look like, you know, Barnum and Bailey kind of things. Yeah. It sounds pretty (laughs) ostentatious. Well, there's a pedestal statue in the kitchen with a very well endowed woman carved out of marble. And the label says, think big in the kitchen In the kitchen. Okay. That's, I feel like that's kind of, you know, that lets you know what you're dealing with here. It really does, doesn't it? It it really does. So after about six years, about 1974, they're pointing fingers at each other. You know, you cheated. No, you cheated. You know, you kicked me. um, You beat me. Um, Priscilla said she often, you know, had to just curl herself into a ball to protect herself. She was tiny. She was a small woman. Um, apparently, he broke her nose twice and broke her collarbone once. Now, I had an accident as a child and pulled all the ligaments and tendons from my collarbone to my breastbone, and that was horribly painful, but it didn't break. And I landed on it um, after flipping over the bars of a scooter. <laughs> I had a little kid. I was babysitting on the back, and I was a bad babysitter. Um, he didn't get hurt, a little fucking Steven Schneider asshole. I did though. And, uh, I did not break my collarbone, but it was pretty bad pain. And I can't imagine having your nose broken twice, which they say is extraordinarily painful, anything around your face and your head, but your collarbone. I mean, I, I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. It just, I hate to say when there's smoke, there's fire, but it's not like she was the first person to accuse him of anything. It is the fact that a lot of people have accused him of everything. His first wife, you know, said he beats me in public and slaps me and and he beats me in private and slaps me in public. So D who was 
Priscilla's oldest daughter from her, her first relationship right out of high school said that he kicked me so many times and so hard that I ended up having blood in my urine. This is his stepdaughter? Yep. Yep. She was a teenager at the time, 18, when when they separated. So she was a teenager. Uh, he kicked me so hard that there was blood in my urine. He is intentionally cruel and violent. My mother brought a kitten into the kitchen that I had. And after he punched me in the face, he slammed the kitten on the floor and killed it. All right. Well, now this is getting a lot darker now. A, a lot darker. And Priscilla couldn't, according to her daughter, D, who's an adult now, said, you know, she just couldn't imagine herself being alone and without a man. And she would say to me, you know, he loves you. And I was a teenager saying, he's crazy. You have to get away from him. He's crazy. And she said, you know, he loves her. Finally, finally, in 1974, she says, that's it. I, I've talked to his first wife. He is who he is. He's not going to change and I have to leave. So she leaves. And of course, it's a long drawn out process and a domestic court judge, remember this name, Judge Joe Edson orders Cullen to move out of his own mansion and to pay Priscilla $3,500 a month in living expenses. That's in 1974. Now, in 1976, as this has drug on, because I'm sure Cullen is fighting it tooth and nail and every other thing he can think of, Judge Edson increases Cullen's payments to $5,000 a month and says, give her an extra $27,000 because she has uh, legal bills to pay and other bills to pay. And that's just, you have a lot of money and that's not enough. And that's when you can see the switch in Cullen's head go click. And he is done. So that night, August 2nd, 1976, after she has gotten a judgment in court for more payment, she is out with her boyfriend, Stan Farr. Priscilla has left her 12-year-old daughter, Andrea, at home to do schoolwork. And um, Dee is older uh, and is out of, and Jack was not there either, the, the son. Andrea is out of the house. I'm sorry, not Andrea. Dee is out of the house. Andrea is at the house. She's 12 years old. Priscilla's on a date with her new boyfriend. Now, Priscilla's about 5'2". <laughs> and Stan Farr was a basketball player handsome, younger than her basketball player. And he's about 6'10". So the pictures of them together are adorable and frightening because her once broken collarbone comes to his belt buckle. It's very interesting seeing them together. So they're on, out on a date. Andrea's at home doing homework. And they come back home. And surprised is not the word, but they notice that the state of the art security system that Colin had installed is not on. She sees a bloody palm print on the wall. And as she's going to investigate, thinking something happened to Andrea, Stan is already up the steps heading to the bedroom to go to bed. Colin Davis jumps out from the kitchen in front of Priscilla wearing all black clothing a long black wig, and he has his hands and feet wrapped in plastic bags. He says, hi, and shoots her in the chest. Oh, for God's sake. By this time, Stan has heard the commotion and is coming downstairs. And she screams at him, back away, back away. Don't, don't, come, don't come down here. And here's this big, giant foot, uh, I said basketball and I meant football, football star, Stan Farr, who tries to kick Cullen in the face and he has been shot in the neck, but he's a big guy and he has been shot five more times. Wow. Now Priscilla is running to Cullen and trying to, to convince him to not do this. And she says, I love you. I've never loved anyone else. Will you please sit down and talk to me? Please sit down and talk to me. And he shoots her in the chest. Now, she has been clawing on him, clamoring on him to not 
kills Stan and her. And after he shoots her, he lets go of her for a second. She holds on to her chest and she runs to the neighbor's house. This is with at least one. Did, did I count right? Two gunshot wounds to the chest? One gunshot wound to the chest. Stan has been shot five times. Oh, Sean, my God. Stan is shot in the neck and then five more shots to the body because he's a big guy. He's a big guy. So a friend of her daughter, D, the one who's out of the house, shows up with her friend because they were supposed to be coming over to the mansion to stay over. It was so big, you wouldn't know if there were a couple of teenage kids there. The gunman, Cullen, runs out chasing after Priscilla, who's running to the neighbors, and he shoots his stepdaughter Dee's friend and her friend in the driveway. Now, Beverly, the, the friend of her daughter, recognizes Cullen also. Now, Gus, her friend, has never met Cullen. But when someone says, it's Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis is shooting us. You're going to remember that, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's Mr. Davis. Please, Mr. Davis, don't shoot. Don't shoot. So Beverly and Priscilla run to get the neighbors to call for help. Now, we find out later that Gus... Survives also, but he is paralyzed now. He was just there with his friend Beverly coming over to these, you know, rich people's house and stay at their mansion. And he gets shot and he's paralyzed for the rest of his life. So Priscilla survives. Beverly survives. Wow. They have a long road. And Gus survives. They have a long road ahead of them. But Stan Farr is dead. And... Remember, Andrea was there by herself doing her homework. Oh, no. Mm Mm-hmm. She is downstairs in the basement. She had been hogtied, was made to kneel, and was shot execution style. Good Lord. Yeah. Priscilla's, you know, daughter with, with Jack Cullen's stepdaughter. Yeah. Has been shot. And it was way before Priscilla and Stan got home. So now, later on, it's it's surmised, you know, if it were Cullen, he didn't mean it. He may have thought that was Priscilla because Andrea is 12 and almost as tall as her mom because her mom is tiny. But Andrea has long, dark hair. Long, oh, come long, on. Dark. I yeah, know. I know. It's on. not. What do you hear? <laughs> what do you hear? The things that are used as excuses. It's it's awful. So the thing that's heartbreaking is that Priscilla had no intention of staying in the mansion. She knew Cullen was going to get his prized home back, and she didn't care. What she wanted was some money from the divorce to live on. And she knew something was going on in Cullen's brain because she hired security guards and even a private investigator and talked to people about the security system saying, you know what, there's problems with the security system. I don't know what's what's going on here, but it's not it's not working very well. And so he was probably messing around with it, right? Right. It's his, it's his house. God damn it! It's his house that he built, his dream house, which we'll find out later from the wonderful insider information from Vanessa. What a what a fantastic house house this is. It's it's pretty strange that Priscilla said, you know. Anyone she could, anyone she could get in earshot. She's on a stretcher. She is thinking she's going to die. She's saying, Cullen Davis shot me. Cullen Davis shot me. Anyone, who, the nurses, as they're bandaging her, please know that Cullen Davis shot me. Anyone who could listen, she wants them to know that it's Cullen. And because she's afraid she's going to die and it's going to go with her. And the poor thing, she lives. And yet telling everyone and anyone, yeah, not, not so not so helpful. She, you know, later on, years later said, it's really odd that Cullen and I got married the day that his, you know, father died and our, our marriage really is going to end because he killed my daughter. So here's where the Texas part, that's so Texas, really, 
starts to kick in. Uh, Cullen is arrested at the home of his new girlfriend, Karen Master, at home in bed with her. Um, it's actually the next morning, I guess. He is treated very differently from anyone else who'd be arrested for two murders and attempted murder on three other people's lives. He is allowed to put a sports coat on, get dressed after getting out of bed with his girlfriend. He uh, is not cuffed. And there are pictures of him being driven in the back of the police car. And he's got his, his hand up on, on, his, on the side of his face, on his jaw, like he's leaning like, hmm, wonder how I'm going to get out of this one. Boy. The DA's office uh, sets his bail at $80,000. $80,000. Uh, which is lunch money. Yeah, that took him a, about an hour. And I can't even believe that the judge who approved this $80,000 bail said, this man's not going to hurt anyone again. The police told me he was quite drunk when they picked him up. And when he gets drunk, he gets really mad. He was just drunk. Okay, this is 1976. 1976, Judge W.W. Matthews. Same, is this the same guy? That, that, no, he's not the same judge as in the... No, no, no. That's, oh, okay. that's Judge Joe Edson. Oh. I wanted you to remember that name for a reason. All right. Yeah, uh, I prefer everyone forget the name Judge W.W. Matthews because... Oh, you know, it, it, it's like... A, <laughs> him didn't mean it. Him was just drunk. Yeah, him contributed lots of money to my campaign for judge or something. Oh, what? I mean, I don't know. No. Yes. Really? So, mm -hmm. uh, really? I uh, guess that right? Oh, Mark, it gets so much worse from here. It gets so much, so much worse from here. So much worse from here. So there are cops that are tailing him because he has his own private jet. <laughs> He's a flight risk being out in an hour on 80 grand bail. So 17 days after he's released on bail, there's a new bond hearing and um, a, a, a judge is like, oh no, no, he needs to, he needs to be locked up. You know, it's a, it's a kind of a small victory, but it's, he, he needs to be locked up because this is ridiculous. And they go to arrest him again, and he's on the steps of the ramp to his private jet. <laughs> he was on his way oh, man. out, and he said, oh, no, 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 no. This was just a very short one-day one day flight to Houston. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very, very short little flight I was going to take to there or Argentina. I mean, uh, Houston. Wow. Yeah. Oh, well, glad they got him, right? Yeah. So, oh, dear God. His friends are thinking, you know, that he would never, ever kill Andrea. She was the sweet little 12 year old. He would never, ever have done that. You know, she had spent um, a month away at, um, you know, her grandmother's house, and she had just come back, and he wasn't expecting her there. And he, you know, he might have thought she was an intruder, you know, 12 year old, long brown haired intruder. Anyway, so he doesn't waste any time getting, you know, the best attorney that he can get. And what's really frightening is that in 1976, this was the first time in <laughs> Texas history. And, and they actually have said, perhaps even in the United States history judicial system, where a defendant had more money than the state who was presenting the case. Is that right? Yes. Oh, wow. More money to defend himself than the state of Texas had to prosecute him. Now that's... That's, that's big. That's huge. That's big. So he already has an attorney on payroll, uh, Pat Burleson, but he adds Richard Racehorse Haynes, who's a big famous criminal defense attorney sounds like he's from texas what makes you say that oh i don't know maybe the racehorse thing i'm just yes. guessing yeah yeah i think racehorse is very very well acquainted with a lot of manure and, and big dicks if you i'm not me, talking about just... the penis part i'm talking about how much shit he throws against the wall in this case yeah and that probably he's a big dick 
Oh, he is a big dick, yeah. He might have one. I don't know. He, I wasn't talking he, about him actually, personally. He's he died just... in 2017. I don't care. Okay, good. I hope he's a, a, a castrati. Um, so he declared that the murders are drug-related and that the mansion was known because of Priscilla's wild ways after Cullen moved out. It's a hotbed of traffic for society narcotics. <laughs> what? Right. So Cullen was only charged with capital murder for the death of Andrea. And he has never, ever had to answer for the other crimes. Now we'll find out later civilly, he, you know, ends up settling a suit with, with Gus Gravel, who was paralyzed. But yeah, so he is charged with capital murder for the death of Andrea. I, I guess, you know, Priscilla's hole in her chest where she is plagued by health issues the rest of her life. That doesn't count. But... What about the football player that was killed? Oh, I guess that was just a mistake. That was I, that was self defense. Uh, okay. We got I'm sorry, but we got a lot. <laughs> we got a lot going here. I can't I wish I could stop, but we got a lot to talk about. So he his girlfriend at the time, Karen Master, looked like Priscilla, but she looked like the he so he has a type. You know, blondes, bo- boofy blondes, and this is, you know, the late seventies. And she and, and Karen is a, a little more polished version of Priscilla, but but you know, but Priscilla in a different coat and she's wealthy on her own. She's a wealthy divorcee and she has two, you know, two kids from a previous marriage and her son um, had an accident and he's special needs, but you know, yeah. So she is his alibi the night of the shootings, the murders. She says that he was in bed with her. Now, when they first question her, she says, um, you know, I had taken a, I had taken a sleeping pill. But I, uh, I don't really know where he was. I think he was there with me. And then, of course, the next time she's questioned, she's like, oh, no, he was there the entire night. He was right there next to me. I think I fell asleep uh, with my head in his pants. So he could not have moved <laughs> without me knowing or hearing his zipper. Uh-huh. Right. So now this is many years later, but we find out. Karen's father, Ray, has ended up bribing the prosecutor's investigator for any information that the prosecution finds on Cullen and how they're going to do their strategy. He paid the DA's investigator $25,000. And he comes back and says there's, there's really no direct evidence to connect Cullen. There's no, you know, he had bags on his hands and feet there's no fingerprints there's no bloody clothes were ever found the wig isn't found and you know it's like but there are eyewitnesses who yeah saw him shoot them and know who he is two of the three know him very well you know what if if she (laughs) if, if she had died and that what she was saying about him being the shooter it would have been a deathbed confession. Mm-hmm. It probably would have gotten him convicted. Uh, honey, I don't agree with you. I'm I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> Producer Mark, I don't agree with you. Really? No. It's Texas. Oh, God. It would not have been considered a deathbed confession. They would have said she was out of her mind with loss of blood, and she was wrong. Wow. If If you live and two people are dead and three people are wounded, one paralyzed for the rest of their life, and you still... Don't have to answer for that. No death, but I don't care if they had him on video. They would say that someone, you know, uh, photoshopped his face in. I'm in 1976. Yes, well, yes, I get you. I listen. I'm I, telling you, the it whole thing is just. Go ahead. Right. So, you know, Priscilla has said, "Look, I, I'm. I might die. This is. You know, this. It was him. It was him, and." in you know racehorse reigns is like uh, i'm sorry racehorse haynes is like uh you know this is my specialty and i'm gonna make you look like a big pile of shit and he's he's very showboaty he uh shocked himself with a cattle prod in court one day to say you know it hurts like hell but it's not deadly i guess one of his clients was being accused of you know <laughs> deadly force and he's like no 
that's you can't kill someone with that. It hurts, but no. He he also threatened to drive a nail through his hand in court to say that it doesn't it's not that painful. Okay. Yeah. So we know what we're dealing with here. Mm-hmm. A showboat. A showboat who, you know. So Karen Masters, sorry, Karen Master Davis is in a Bible study group with Tipster Vanessa. And Tipster Vanessa gives us her firsthand account of what she saw. So she says, when we first went into the mansion in a group, we were greeted with open arms by Karen. And I couldn't help but feel she was on stage and letting us in on her life with the newly converted Cullen and all of their blessings. Now, Karen stayed, you know, with Cullen and defended him until she passed away. She led us first to the master bedroom up this massive marble staircase, and the staircase was beautiful. But the master bedroom and bath, (laughs) it's huge, uh, overly mirrored, uh, gold swan water fixtures. Uh, The bath fixture was a gold swan as big as a baby swan. (laughs) Like, it was huge. So after everyone oohed and awed, they were led back downstairs to what was called the White Room, which had a lot of ancient artifacts that Cullen had collected, priceless paintings. Everything in the room was white. The carpet, there was silk couches, and the cabinets for all the artifacts are are in a white, are white. Everything is white. And Vanessa says she's never seen photos of that room in any of the investigations, but she wanted it known there was a white room. So they were then led to the kitchen and the laundry room area, and there were two women working there, one in the kitchen, one in the laundry room. They were both black, and they had little neat and tidy brown and tan uniforms with white aprons over them. And Vanessa said, I was struck and offended by how old fashioned this looked. She said it was like they were silent accessories. So they're led to a round seating area with the fireplace in the middle to talk about their Bible study. And she said, you know, it felt like this was probably used for more than Bible study during the heyday. And there were rumors there were... Well, you know, whatever could that mean? Right. <laughs> rumors that there were orgies, etc. And Karen is very calculated and saying over and over again how lucky she is to be married to such a wonderful guy like Cullen and live in this beautiful place. Um, Vanessa said the murders were never brought up and they were never allowed to go into the basement where Andrea was executed. But she also knows that there's at least one tunnel under the house And that's never been mentioned either. So after Cullen has become, um, he's found God in his time in the lockup, he becomes very uh, close to a televangelist named James Robinson from Dallas. And James Robinson would be very uh, hellfire and brimstone and very damnation. And he's very black and white. And you know, those sorts of things like killing your stepdaughter and your wife's date and trying to kill your wife and two strangers, those things um, would be in the black if you were James Robinson. But he, you know, has suddenly found a lot of compassion and he wants to be more inclusive of sinners and those who have transgressed. Oh, now that he's gotten to know old Cullen. Right. And uh, huh? And uh, all of the green stuff f- falling out of Cullen's pockets. Potentially. That's where yeah, I'm, I'm I was going. Just being cynical, <laughs> I guess. I don't even think it's, I don't think it's cynicism. I think we can tell that it's the truth. So the trial goes on. And Priscilla shows up and she's not wearing her rich bitch necklace. She's wearing a cross. And Racehorse Reigns makes sure that he tells everyone, you know, where's your rich bitch necklace? Oh, I'm not wearing it. Why are you wearing a cross now? 
well, this has been with me most of my life. If I wasn't wearing it, it was in my purse. So Racehorse Reigns portrays her as um, a drunk, uh, a big spender, uh, used Cullen's wealth to fund her, you know, lavish lifestyle after she'd gotten him kicked out of his own house. Um, she's, you know, uh, potentially hooked up with some drug lords that would have come in and shot her saying they were, they were Cullen. Oh, fuck. what? Right. Now she's still recovering from being shot in the chest. Now she's on pain meds and, you know, that apparently didn't help. And the fact that Cullen Davis is, you know, probably a sociopath who, doesn't have feelings or emotions. He's just very calm and, you know, very calm and collected and, you know, just looks like, yeah, I'll I'll just, I'll just hang in here and listen to whatever you people have to say about me. And I know I'm, I'm good. I'm all good. So poor Priscilla is really raked 11 days. She's raked over the coals and it, she doesn't come off as, as a great witness. And she's, you know, she's had a hard time and she's still recovering. And much like what I'm guessing happened when Charles Manson was arrested, Cullen Davis has a group of fans. Every day after court, when he's led away, he is allowed to stop and sign autographs. I no. Yes. No. Yes. Christ on a crutch. He uh, is allowed to eat gourmet food during the lunch breaks, I guess, because he pays for it to be brought in. They actually called it Cullen Mania. His uh, girlfriend, or maybe she's not his wife at the time, I don't know, Karen is there, and there are other very attractive women around him who, you know, walk him to and from court. So he has escorts, female escorts that are like, Beautiful. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, they run up to him and are all up in his shit, and he signs autographs for a bunch of women. Wow. Women. So Marilyn Schwartz from the Dallas Morning News probably said it best when she said, you know, on the stand, Priscilla was just done in. They turned her into the biggest slut in the state of Texas. Uh, her child was murdered. She almost died. But Racehorse Haynes did a brilliant job of keeping those facts out of the courtroom. So there really is a thing where if you are a great actor, um, if you can distract people, even people who have been impaneled on a jury, you can, you know, your client gets to go home that night or gets to at least have gourmet food to eat. So four months after the trial began, November of 1977, it takes the jury four and a half hours to deliberate and say he's not guilty of killing Andrea. This, this, this makes me sick. It gets, it gets worse. We're, we're closing in on the end, but I'm telling you, it gets, it gets so much worse. So the night he's acquitted, he has a big party at the most popular place in town, and it's called Rhett Butler. So there's tons of booze. Um, there's well-wishers, the media, his groupies, the trial judge. The trial judge. Members of the jury and the bailiffs. Okay. <laughs> are at his acquittal party at Rhett Butler. Now, some of the jurors actually came out and said, you know, I don't know that he's actually innocent, but there's definitely reasonable doubt. Yeah, and these drinks are great. And these free drinks are delicioso. My favorite juror said, rich people don't kill, they hire hitmen. Now keep that in mind. Uh, uh, okay. So you would think that after being beaten up in court, that the state may have been like, you know what, we're going to fucking try this asshole for the murder of Stan Farr and for the attempted murder of Gus Gravel and the attempted murder of Priscilla Davis. 
but they're, you know, I think he's invincible. We're not, we're not going to proceed anymore. I think they just, they gave up maybe figuring he's even got more money than we do. So they're still, because Priscilla lived, they're still in the middle of their divorce. And Judge Edson, Judge Joe Edson has ruled in Priscilla's favor a few times. And Cullen is like, you know, that, that shit, that shit ain't going to fly. And you know, that one female juror said, rich people don't kill people, but they pay people to kill them. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. So he approaches a former business associate named David McCrory and says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to kill Judge Joe Edson. I want you to kill Priscilla. And I want you to kill her daughter, Dee. So McCrory runs straight to the FBI and the FBI says, would you mind wearing a wire? And when he gives you the money, we're going to videotape it. And uh, David McCrory's like, you betcha. Judge Joe Edson completely cooperated. And like a lot of stings that happen when you try and hire someone to kill someone, he's in the trunk of a car laying flat in the trunk of a car. And this is the part that's a little bit heartbreaking. What they used to back up the fake assassination is ketchup from McDonald's, hand to God. Okay. Hand to motherfucking God. Ketchup from McDonald's packets on Judge Edson's body to prove to Cullen that David McCrory had quote unquote killed him. So he takes pictures of Judge Edson in the trunk. He meets him <laughs> to to do the exchange. And it's on tape. And it's like, this is, this is, you know, this is, we've got him now truly dead to rights. He says, so, all right, here's the picture of the judge. Give me the money. Um, you want a lot of people dead, right? And Cullen Davis says, all right. He goes, no, no, wait, you want, you want a lot of people dead, right? All right. Okay. So he's arrested right in the parking lot after the money exchange. And what do you think Racehorse Haynes does this time? I can't wait. Oh, you, I you, can, you, but go you ahead. You can, but yeah. So he, he got paid $250,000 for the first case. And he's like, no, nah, I'm not going to do this for less than $2 million. This is a bigger bump in the road. A bump in the road, uh -huh. yeah. And that's literally what he tries to have it put off as. So what he says is that David McCrory was the bad guy, that the FBI had called Cullen Davis and said, would you pretend to hire David McCrory to kill the judge, your wife, and your stepdaughter, because we're going to catch him. I, I, my head is spinning now. Your I, head should be spinning. Yeah. The FBI is like, why would we ever contact him? We would, it, this is a farce, and you're still trying to make this Priscilla's fault. <laughs> you... This is ridiculous. So the, the jurors are like, you know, it's like, how are they not like, all right, we're done. One no. would think. No, no. It's uh, eight to four for his guilt. And it's deadlocked. It's uh, called a mistrial. And they are done. During this trial, it's uh, his birthday falls during the second trial. And... He had a little party in his cell, including the sheriff of For Fort Worth, who actually brought presents to him. And do you know what the presents are? Uh. His old prison uniform from the first trial and a hacksaw and a, you know, um, a fake key to the jail. Oh, boy. There's no accounting for taste, huh? I I'm just, I'm flummoxed. So November 9th of 1979, the jury comes back deadlocked eight to four. He walks out a free man. Wow. 
Right. I, I there's nothing I can say other than wow. I'm I'm I, I'm just I'm at a loss for words. Right. So there's a retrial, and this one is really fascinating because Racehorse Haynes gets a linguistic specialist to be an expert witness. And he said he can tell from the audio tapes that David McCrory had of him asking to murder the judge, his wife, and his stepdaughter, that he was under duress and that they were trying to trap him. How? What? Yeah. The linguistic specialist said, you know. I just, it's, it's absurd. The whole thing is absurd. It's way beyond absurd, and it's heart, heartbreaking. So, Judge Edson, probably to save his own skin, is like, after the second acquittal, he's like, I'm retiring. I'm retiring. I can't, I'm afraid I'm going to be murdered. And there's a new judge that rules over their divorce. And surprise, surprise, it goes in Cullen's favor. Yeah, I'm shocked. He gets his house back and all of its contents. Priscilla receives a settlement of $3.5 million instead of what her lawyers were asking for. And she gives up. So the other victims also have lawsuits against him. And those are much easier to manage, you know, because he's got lots of money. So... He does reach an out-of-court settlement with Gus Gravel, Gavrel, who is um, paralyzed. Um, in exchange, he will not testify against Cullen, you know, at a, a trial in a civil suit. Uh, Priscilla also got a settlement of $5 million, but she's never received any money. She's never received any money. Mm -mm. I wonder how that worked. Um, I don't know. But I can tell you Stan Farr's sons have a suit against him. And maybe he already had um, declared bankruptcy, although I think he was hiding it somewhere. But they received a settlement of $250,000. Now, they've never gotten a dime of it. It's now up to $2 million with interest. Yeah, he must have declared bankruptcy. Yeah. So Stan Farr's son shows up to meet with Cullen Davis under the guise of saying, you know, I would love to talk to you about this um, in relation to the Bible and God and mm hmm so he had declared bankruptcy in 1986 and said that he had debts of over $230 million. And, you know, the recession in the early 80s had just, you know, reduced his, uh, his fortune considerably. So the minister, James Robinson, who has probably gotten, you know, his, his uh, share of uh, lots of money, uh, tells him that all of the ivory statues and jade and diamonds are um, and around his house are false idols. And he needs to break them up with a sledgehammer and throw them in a lake. Really? I think what he probably did was get rid of some things and keep the money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he starts a, um, Cullen Davis starts a little side gig called Skin Pro Tech 2, and it's supposed to protect the hands of mechanics and outdoor workers. But he really, his main, you know, interest becomes religion. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. He is a member of the First Baptist Church of Euless. Um, You know, when questioned about how religious he really is, he says, I'm in good shape. I have no legal problems to speak of. I'm not a falling down drunk. I'm not on dope. I have no insurmountable problems and I have money. Many people who find God have one or more of these problems. So what would it benefit me to accept the Lord in my life if I weren't sincere? Oh, I don't know. Maybe you just get away with murder and <laughs> an attempted murder and murder for hire. and Right. So he ends up adopting Karen's 
two children. So he becomes this, you know, family man. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he also has uh, two ch children of his own with Karen. And she stands by him until she passed away from cancer in September of 2016. The mansion was eventually sold, and it's sort of an event space now. It's got a steakhouse, a restaurant, and a church. It's pretty fascinating. Sounds very Texas. Yeah. Priscilla died of cancer in February of 2001. She was 59. You know, she survived the, you know, the attempted murder. She lived for as long as she could on the divorce settlement. But she, you know, as her, you know, uh, second husband said, she's generous to a fault. She spent most of, you know, her money helping her, her friends, her kids, um, her daughter, Dee, the oldest daughter, who had a drug problem and ended up doing a couple of stints in jail. Uh, her son, Jack, was, you know, had a drug problem and he was found dead on a Fort Worth bench from an overdose. But Dee is now you know, doing well and loves her mother very much and would love to find justice for her mother because I can't believe that Cullen Davis is still alive. He's a monster. But the thing that Vanessa said that I thought was oh, so beautiful when she got the insider view of the Davis mansion is that the abrupt and disjointed angles of the mansion itself mirrors Cullen's personality and his relationships. And I can't think of any way to say it better than that. And if you know anything that may help someone with fresh eyes see this case and get this bastard a real conviction, please call the Fort Worth Police Department you can call us here at Just the Tipsters. You can email us and we will make it anonymous like we have done with Vanessa and more cowbell. And remember that number is 832-TIPSTER, 832-847-7837, or email us at jttipsters at gmail.com. Melissa, would you like a Mountain Dew kickstart? <laughs> <laughs>